I'm Dr. Baird Powell, Section Chief of Hematology and Oncology at Wake Forest Baptist Health. We're going to discuss non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lymphomas are diseases that largely involve the lymph nodes. Among the lymphomas, about 10% are Hodgkin's disease. Uh, at this point, we will focus on the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and how you diagnose and treat. You, like everyone, would like to know how you got lymphoma. Most of the time, we do not know. There are very few known causes of lymphoma. We know that people are at higher risk if they have a suppressed immune system, either through medications or through diseases that do suppress the immune system. We know that people are exposed to high doses of certain toxins, such as benzenes, Agent Orange for men that served in Vietnam, uh, or some, sometimes some of our uh, chemotherapy drugs that we use for other cancers rarely cause uh, non Hodgkin's lymphomas, but for most patients, we do not know what causes. this. There are few infections that have an increased risk, for example, exposure to uh, viruses such as Epstein Barr virus on a nucleosis may have some increased risk, but for the majority of patients, we never know what causes their lymphoma. Most patients with lymphoma present with some enlargement of the lymph nodes. Frequently, that's a, they feel a lymph node, it does not go away, and so they see their doctor. That results in a biopsy of that lymph node and usually a diagnosis. Keep in mind that lymphomas are among the more difficult cancers to diagnose for both your doctor and for the pathologist who's trying to interpret those slides. So sometimes there are uh, days to weeks before you can confirm a diagnosis. But confirming and getting the right diagnosis is essential to developing your future treatment. Once you have a diagnosis of lymphoma, uh, it's important to figure out the extent of the disease and we'll go over the staging in just a moment. But the workup initially will usually involve some CT scans and usually PET scans to uh, see where the lymph nodes are throughout your body and also bone marrow testing where we take a sample of the bone marrow to see if the lymphoma involves the bone marrow. Once your diagnosis has been confirmed, we then proceed to staging. There you're trying to establish how widespread your disease is because that impacts your treatment as well as your prognosis. Involved in that staging are some of the testing we previously described, such as the bone marrow and the CT scans and the PET scans. Stage one is one lymph node area. So in, for example, the side of your neck, you can have multiple nodes, but that's one lymph node area under your arm. Stage two is two or more lymph node areas, but on the same side of the diaphragm, either all above the diaphragm or all below the diaphragm. Stage three are lymph node areas, but involve both sides of the diaphragm. And stage four means it's gotten outside of the lymphatic system so it doesn't involve just the lymph nodes, but it also involves other areas, among the more common being the bone marrow, that's why we did the bone marrow testing, and the liver, and we saw that on the CT and or PET scan. Other areas may be involved, such as skin, brain, bones, and many other tissues can be involved, but the most common by far are the liver and the bone marrow. Within each of the four staging systems, there's an A and a B. A means you're asymptomatic, so you have no symptoms from your, your lymphoma. B means you have B symptoms, and there are three of those. Fever, night sweats, or weight loss greater than 10%. And general B symptoms mean that you have either more aggressive disease or more widespread disease, and those will have impact on your treatment as well as your prognosis. Most lymphomas are B-cell lymphomas. That's a type of lymphocytes but there are a subgroup that are T-cell lymphomas and that can make a difference in how we treat you. In addition, uh, the larger subtype grouping is the so-called diffuse or large cell lymphomas versus the follicular or frequently also of small cells. And those are pathologic diagnoses and one of the reasons it's very difficult for your doctor and pathologist to, to find, have a final diagnosis, they need to determine these type characteristics because it makes a big difference in how you treat. Briefly, the diffuse or large cell lymphomas, which are representative of the more aggressive type, do tend to grow more rapidly, have much more aggressive disease, and therefore need to be treated more aggressively. The large cell lymphomas almost always end up being treated with a combination of chemotherapy. There are a few patients with, very, uh, with stage 1 disease, that 1A disease, that do not have any symptoms, have very isolated disease, that sometimes can be controlled with radiation. But for the majority of patients with diffuse large cell uh, lymphomas and other aggressive lymphomas, it will be a combination chemotherapy. 
The backbone chemotherapy for most patients has been a combination of drugs called CHOP, C-H-O-P, abbreviations for four different chemotherapy drugs. And frequently with the B-cell lymphomas in combination that is given a antibody called rituximab. I won't go into details because your doctor will be choosing individualized treatment for you, but that's the standard treatment. The CHOP regimen can be done as an outpatient, usually done about every three weeks, and up to six or eight cycles of treatment, minimum of six. If your disease is gone after four cycles, you stop after six. If your disease is gone after six cycles, you do two more and you go to eight cycles total. In contrast to the large, more aggressive lymphomas, follicular lymphomas can be much more indolent or slow growing. Depending on the subtype within the indolent lymphomas, you may not need treatment right now. Many of patients can be observed, especially if they're asymptomatic and they have very, fairly isolated disease or a fairly slow growing disease. Decisions to treat you are based on such things as any symptoms you might have. Uh, if you have uh, more rapidly growing disease, uh, those are indications for treatment. There are subsets that do need to be treated right away, so you and your doctor will work together to figure out whether you need treatment right now. When patients do not need treatment, they're frequently followed with the exams, laboratory studies, and usually some kind of scanning to determine the growth pattern of their disease. And the frequency of that, once again, is dependent on your particular disease and how it functions over the first few months. And then you can determine how frequently you need to be followed. If and when you do need treatment for a follicular lymphoma, the treatments are sometimes a bit less aggressive than they are for large cell lymphomas, and they may involve just one or two agents. Sometimes we can use just the rituximab, for example, or rituximab plus one or two other drugs. So there's a lot more variability among the follicular diseases on how aggressively to treat, when to treat, and stopping points for treatment. The large cell lymphomas tend to be more aggressive, treated more aggressively, and more highly curable, whereas the low-grade lymphomas are more indolent, they don't grow as fast, but they do tend to hang on and they may go and come. You may treat them and they go away for a while and then they'll come back and you need more treatment. So they're more of a chronic disease, whereas the large cell lymphomas are much more aggressive acute disease. For all patients, your treatment will be followed by scanning or follow-up and then possibility of further treatment down the road. There are other treatments down the road if you have aggressive disease, such as bone marrow transplants, but those aren't needed by many, by many of the patients. But if needed, your doctor can work with you on that. If, if you have an indolent lymphoma, your subsequent treatment may be very similar to your first treatment, and many patients need to be treated multiple times because, as we said, this turns into somewhat of a chronic disease. Your prognosis or your long-term outlook is driven by a number of factors that your doctor will talk to you about. You might want to ask them about what prognostic factors you have. These include some chemical tests, as well as your age, your performance status, how active and functional you are. So all those are factored in and, and there, there are patterns or processes. One is called the IPI scoring system and another for follicular lymphoma is the FLIPI or the follicular IPI score that help predict prognosis for patients and your doctor might be able to give you in some insight once you have all of your initial test results. Issues that you will want to discuss with your doctor include your type of lymphoma, what are some of your prognostic factors, what is your anticipated treatment what's the duration of your treatment, and then probably more importantly nearing the end of your treatment, what will be the follow-up schedule? How often will scans be done? How often will you see the doctor? Any long-term complications you might expect from your treatment, and any particular warnings that you should have. One issue that you should keep in mind is that some of the drugs that are used for treating lymphomas can cause infertility. So uh, men of uh, who desire children potentially in the future should consider sperm banking, the storage away of sperm. And increasingly in young women, there is the opportunity to collect and store eggs for future use if needed. Not everyone will become sterile with their treatment, so by all means do not depend on this for your birth control. 
And uh, if you're sexually active during treatment, please take appropriate precautions because the drugs that you will be receiving are dangerous to any potential fetus, so be cautious. Any cancer is very scary. Fortunately for many lymphoma patients, they have a disease that's very responsive to our treatment. And for many of our patients, they can be cured of their disease. But in all cases, it's scary and it gets your attention. You have many resources available to you. Guidepost of Strengths is one such resource. Please make use of them and their services, your physician, your family, your friends, and your community resources. And good luck with your journey through cancer.